Good morning. Welcome to Springfield United Methodist Church. Uh, glad you could join us out there for worship today. A um, couple of announcements before we get started. Uh, first of all, I wanted to mention um, this morning we had a couple of technical difficulties with our uh, Sunday school lesson this morning. So later on, we'll either be um, republishing that through video or live feed. Um, so be on the lookout for that. Um, earlier this week, we had a children's ice cream ministry um, that happened on Wednesday. So we wanted to thank everybody who participated in that and all of God's hands that served in that, um, in that ministry. Um, heard that it was a great time uh, for all the children out there. Uh, the other thing that I'm really excited about, because uh, it's referring to the youth, is uh, this week um, we have uh, got the green light to go ahead um, and start uh, small groups in person, um, mainly due to the size of our small groups that we can uh, be with under those guidelines. So we're extremely excited about that. Uh, this Thursday, um, we're going to go ahead and plan to have uh, small groups in person. Um, at the Family Life Center um, at 7 o'clock for high school girls and boys small group. Um, we're probably going to have one outside and one inside. Uh, the last thing is we had a, um, just wanted to mention very generally, we had a board meeting earlier uh, this week uh, on Tuesday. And uh, just wanted to say that the board meeting went well and that be on the lookout for some detailed communication with respect to um, uh, the details of those services as we start up on June 28th. So we're going to plan on starting up services on June 28th. Uh, I did want to mention too that um, um, the reason why you're looking at me is Brother Ken is, is taking a day off. Um, uh, well, uh, uh, well needed rest for him um, and we thank him for his, uh, he's just been awesome. Um, for our church to have somebody like Brother Ken, uh, it's amazing. His heart um, his love for Christ uh, that he's uh, shared uh, that with us over the past weeks and months um, in several different ways. Uh, so thank you, Brother Ken, for that. Um, I'd just like to lead us in an uh, opening prayer uh, before we begin to worship. So if you bow your heads with me. Thank you, Lord, um, for this day. Uh, Lord, thank you for just this opportunity uh, just to be in your house, uh, be in the house of worship with you, uh, the protection that we have, the safety that we have, and the privilege and honor that we have, Lord, just to glorify your name. Uh, I ask that you be with us um, today, each and every one of us here, Lord, uh, that our actions and our, and our words and our thoughts be uh, spoken to glorify you um, in your name, in, in your word, Lord. Uh, I pray for every listening ear out there today, Lord, just to lift up their hearts, uh, open their hearts to you, be open uh, to what the Holy Spirit has in store for them today uh, through song, uh, through scripture, uh, through singing, Lord, uh, just be with each and every one of them out there. Uh, thank you, Lord, for me, for the privilege, Lord, just to, just to have the opportunity to be able to speak today, Lord. Um, what an honor it is. So I just ask that you be with uh, me um, during the scripture uh, today, Lord, and just anoint my words, Lord, that they, my words be your words, um, and they cascade out to each and every person out there, Lord. Just use me as a vessel uh, for your great work. Um, thank you so much, Lord, uh, and we love you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. So um, I'm going to uh, move into... Um, to prepare our hearts for worship, um, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Linda and Melissa uh, as we prepare our hearts for worship.
Thank you, Miss Linda and Melissa, for that great prelude for the beauty of the earth. Again, on behalf of Eric and Alyssa and the preacher, welcome to the Springfield Methodist Church again today. We are going to worship, and it's good to be in the house of the Lord this morning. This Sunday is Trinity Sunday. Trinity Sunday, where we acknowledge and we observe and we recognize the importance of the Godhead, of our great God, Jehovah God, the Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. So as we continue our worship, we're going to sing one of the great hymns of our faith that speak to that Trinitarian God that we honor this morning. We're going to start our service this morning with Holy, Holy, Holy Lord God Almighty in the Methodist hymnal. That is page 64. So please join us as we sing this great hymn of our faith. So I'm going to um, 
go into a word of prayer this morning, and I just want to get a little bit closer uh, to the video. Uh, <clears throat> so before we go into a word of prayer, I just I would just ask that we prepare our hearts out there, Lord, just uh, just to give us a sense of peace and patience right now as we go into a word of prayer. Dear gracious heavenly loving Father, we are so honored again today to have this opportunity to be with you in your house. We thank you just Lord for the privilege to glorify your name. Dear Lord, there are so many prayers out there uh, that each and every one of us have. Our prayer, our strongest prayer should be that our Holy Spirit move in us today. There's so many things going on in our world right now that bring confusion and bring doubt and complexity, Lord. But you are truth. Just help us to turn to your word for truth, Lord. In all of these circumstances, Lord, you are truth. Your word is sharper than a double-edged sword. It pierces us in each and every moment, moment that we have, Lord. Help us just to be cognizant of that. Before we react to something, before we jump to conclusions, before we respond, Lord, just help us to rest in your peace. Help us to just rest in your glory. Help us to just rest in the victory that you've already had for us, that you've won for us, Lord. Help us to just lean into you, Lord, for each and everything that we do in life. Not just the big things, but for the small things too, Lord. To not count you out of anything in our lives. The past couple of weeks and months have been very interesting and awkward, as we humans would call this, Lord. But we know that you've done a mighty work. That you've done a mighty work in our families, that you've done a mighty work in our hearts, that you've shown conviction to us in so many ways, Lord, that we wouldn't typically recognize. So I just ask that you continue to work that through us, Lord. I pray for our world leaders. I pray for our nation. I pray for our government. I pray that they do just that, Lord, that in each and every situation that we face, Lord, that they turn to you for truth and discernment and guidance before making any rash decisions, before moving. Your word is powerful, Lord. I pray for those that are in dire need right now, Lord. Those families that are struggling financially, I pray for those that are healing right now, Lord, are beginning to heal, that are sick, that need you to come just, Lord, and show your grace and your mercy upon them. So we pray for that in Jesus' name today, that you just work in their lives and show them the hope that you bring every day that we see, Lord. We pray for every person out there, Lord. That they just to see that your ways are not our ways, but they're beautiful ways, they're truth. That we can see meaning through them. That we can turn to them in every aspect of our lives so that we would be converted, Lord, into a people, into a body of Christ that you would call us to be, as it says in your word. We thank you again, Lord. We just ask that you continue to be with us as we continue it in our worship. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to turn it over to Keith as we continue our worship. As we continue our worship, let us um, sing When We All Get to Heaven in our hymnal. That is hymn 701. So when we all get to heaven, please join us as we sing.
continue our worship, we will have an offertory played by Miss Linda and Miss Melissa. He loves me. And then following that, Teresa Lane will sing, We'll Never Walk Alone. And then most importantly, after that, Eric will break the word of the bread of life and he will expound upon the word of God. So be in prayer as we continue our worship.
Good morning again, church family. Um, before I get started, I, I just wanted to say a couple of things. Um, uh, Brother Ken had actually asked me about this earlier to would I be willing to do this? And, and um, there wasn't much resistance uh, for me on my part, mostly because um, I think of Ken. Um, and I think of um, how much he pours out his heart and his life into this church. Um, and he needs a break, and uh, a good break. Um, so we pray for Ken that, uh, that he gets a good rest um, and rejuvenates and that just the Holy Spirit just give him a peace and patience uh, right now. And so um, as I was thinking, you know, the hard part about going through one of these scripture lessons is uh, what does God want you to say? Uh, what does he want you uh, to profess um, to those out there listening? And um, so I've been praying and I've been seeking and as some of you might be aware that uh, my wife and I have been doing some uh, studies uh, for the youth over the past couple of weeks, months, uh, one in Revelations and then one in Acts. And there's a point in Acts where um, uh, it was a pretty strong period in Peter's life where it has been speaking to me about conviction. Um, so when I started thinking about conviction, I started praying and seeking, you know, God, where can I go with this lesson? Um, and he started giving me uh, words. Uh, he started giving me words. He, he gave me first conviction, and then he gave me uh, confession, and then he gave me conversion. Uh, so that's what I want to speak about today. Uh, those are the three key things that pop out that he's been uh, just leaning on my heart to share with you. Uh, so first of all, I wanted to talk about the word conviction. So when we think about the word conviction... Um, and I just want to start with the definition of conviction here in a standard definition. It says, with a formal declaration that someone is guilty or a criminal offense made by a verdict or a jury. So when we typically think of the word conviction, we think of, you know, a trial, you know, uh, or we can relate to a trial of some sort. When you think about law convictions, you think about there's several things that are involved in a conviction of law. Uh, the act itself, the intent, or the concurrence or repeatability of something to justify it. And then in most those, you have also witnesses. You have witnesses that um, can attest to what either event has happened. So I just want you to put that in your, uh, your hearts for a minute, those, those couple of things. And I, if you would turn to me to the Word of God in Acts chapter 10, verse 13 through 15, we'll read it together, if you would. Uh, then a voice told him, get up, Peter, kill and eat. Surely not, Lord, Peter replied, I have never eaten anything impure or unclean. The voice spoke to him a second time. Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. So if you have read the scriptures or the text in Acts, just to put into context, this is a vision that Peter had, um, had gained from God. Um, and it was pre pretty much what it was saying was is that there was a division or some sort of thing between him and the Gentiles. If you look at Peter, he was stuck in uh, Jewish traditional ways historically. Uh, there was some sort of an intent to the separation of those groups. There was a lifestyle of years of division between the Jews and the Gentiles. And then, of course, people could witness this from going on to the fact that Peter, while preaching the gospel of Jesus, clearly still had something, something he was holding on to. You see, Peter was convicted here by the fact that God, he said, do not call anything clean, unclean, that I have made clean or cleansed. So the work of Jesus Christ has been done. And so what he's convicting him of 
is his old ways, that he needs to turn from his old ways and remove this separation to not only spread the word of God further, but to build the body of Christ. And so the things I think about today, you know, what are some of the convictions that we have today in our lives? And I think about, I, I can't but help think about the past couple of weeks and the past couple of months. So what are we being convicted today? I think back to this whole pandemic and some things come to mind. Maybe God is trying to convince us that our spreading of the gospel before the pandemic was enough. So he exploded, the, he wasn't enough. So he exploded the use of technology to reach millions. Maybe a ministry that now we're convicted of that we can utilize to spread the word even more out to those in homes, uh, families, uh, whoever can have access to technology. Maybe God has convicted us of our family relationships. He wanted us home to show us we needed to spend more time with our loved ones. Think about our actions as an intent before all of this happened. Where were our priorities? Where were our priorities? Now everything that has been closed down or shut down and now is starting to reopen. But think about that. Taking away the very things that sometimes we inadvertently put our hearts and our minds into. Maybe God has convicted us that our faith has been in such things of the world and not of him. Think about everything uh, that has been shut down. That these things are fun and they're not bad but a lifestyle became engulfed into such things that drove our energy towards them and not towards god maybe god is convicting us of how much community and human interaction is important you don't truly learn to appreciate something until it's gone this might just make us put our phones down that's pretty powerful um, just to be in community with others and have human interaction. You know, we're going down this, you know, spiral of the technology and social media and things like that. But I don't know about y'all out there, but I want to be touched and I want to be loved and I want to be with my church family. I want to be together with them again. And so maybe we've been convicted of that. Maybe God has uh, put this on our hearts. And then maybe when everything reopens up that this place will be fuller and churches will be fuller than they ever have been before. Amen. The next word that comes to mind is confession. So usually after you get convicted of something or the Holy Spirit convicts you of something, there's a confession. So if you think about the word confession, you think about a formal statement that one is admitting the guilt of a crime. When you think of confession, you think a couple things. You think of free will. You think voluntary. And you also think about the specifics of something that happened. You're recounting the details of what happened. So if you go into the scripture with me in Psalm 32, 3 through 5. Psalm of David. When I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For a day and night, your hand was heavy on me. My strength was sapped as in heat of summer. Then I acknowledged my sin to you and did not cover up my iniquity. I said, I confess my transgressions to the Lord and you forgave the guilt of my sin. So if you think about David and think about the sins with Bathsheba, listen to his, listen to what he's saying here. You can see how the Holy Spirit has convicted him. But what happens during that time of conviction, moving over to confession? Notice he says, roaming all day long. You feel so overwhelmed with conviction, it's starting to boil inside. Your heart is heavy. 
You must let it out. You know, it says in 1 John 1, 9, it says, If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. I can tell you in the times of my life that I felt like David. That I was weeping, kneeling, and emotionally broken by the weight of my sin. You know, Lisa and I were talking about the other day, and she's been such a blessing in my life, is that we're talking about how light overtakes darkness. You know, it's not until we bring our darkness to Jesus, the light, he is the light, that it can be fully removed. The darkness and light is so powerful if you think about it. If you think about what's going on in our country right now, it's bringing all of the darkness out we have into the light for everyone to see. We're confessing the depths of our hearts and our actions and our words and our thoughts and maybe now more than ever is a time to pray to God to search our hearts and confess to Jesus our ways. Psalm 139, 23, 24 says, Search me, God, know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there are any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. What do we individually and as God's children, as a people, what do we need to confess today? Maybe it's our anger that is stirred up by so many things that's going on. Maybe it's our greed to have our own ways. Maybe it's our inadvertent judgment upon things that we are called not to judge. Maybe it's our pridefulness that we need to confess today. You know, so after, after we're convicted and after God pierces our hearts so we confess, there's a conversion that happens. And if you think about the word conversion, the process of changing or causing something to change from one form to the other. So just some practical thoughts on conversion. So if you were to convert something, you have to understand how it's created in the first place. You have to understand its inventor. The critical elements that make up the specifications, the instruction manual. So the scripture reading here for conversions is actually in the Old Testament, Daniel 4, 34 through 37. Now, just to put it in context here, if you've read the story of King Nebuchadnezzar, He had a dream, and he wanted somebody to interpret the dream. And Daniel translates the dream for him. So I just want you to think about that in preparation for this. Daniel 4, 34 through 37. But at the end of that period, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes towards heaven, and my reason returned to me. I'm going to highlight that word, return, to me. And I bless the Most High and praise and honor him who lives forever. For his dominion is an everlasting dominion and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing. He does, but he does according to his will in the host of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. 
and no one can ward off his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the time, my reason returned to me. My majesty and splendor were restored to me for a glory of my kingdom, my counselors, my nobles, beginning seeking me out. So I was reestablished in my sovereignty and surpassing greatness was added to me. There was a conversion going on there. But notice the words, the key words in that scripture in the word of God is returned, restored, reestablished. You know, if you had your, if you had something going back, if you had something broke, let's say your iPhone or your appliance or your car or something that breaks, what are most people going to do? Probably seek how it was invented. Probably go to the manual. Probably go to the specifications on how it was created so that you could troubleshoot it. The Word of God is our manual. It's our instruction. The king here was acknowledging, if you think back to the return, restored, and reestablishing, I can't help but think of Genesis 1.27 that says, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created it male and female. He created them. The Holy Spirit works in our lives to get us back to where we were intended to be in the first place before the fall. His Holy Word and His Son, Jesus Christ, is our manual. We need to ask ourselves today, what is our manual and what is our instruction book we're using today? Is it our Facebook feeds? Are we allowing the media to control what we think? Is it the perceptions of what others think of us? You know, there's a lot of, there's a lot of, uh, videos and postings going on and then I saw one the other day that really struck me and I just want to quote and read what this man said and I just want y'all to think about it for a minute someone said it's not that I hate these people it's that I hate myself because of the perceptions that they've built against me. I start to think of myself less, and when you hate yourself, you have a tendency not to love and ultimately have no regard for life. This is a pretty powerful example. So you think about, are you building your life on the perceptions that people have of you? Are you willing to, or are you willing to submit and accept to the ones whose perception of you is the only, is that he wishes that you loved him and accepted him? Jesus' perception of us is that we are loved and we are his children. And he wants us to be with him. So there's one more word I wanted to talk about today, and I didn't mention it. <clears throat> and that other word is conformance. And if you think about the word conformance or compliance, in a practical sense, it's meeting certain standards or specifications of something to a T. You know, I've been buying parts for over 20 years at Gulfstream. I just celebrated my 28th year at Gulfstream, and I buy parts. And one of the things that we do is that every time we order a part, it has a specification. It has something testing it has to go through. It has some sort of an inspection it has to go through to get through the door. If a product does not meet that specific criteria, it will be rejected at the door and sent back to be repaired, 
to be upgraded or recertified. So the scripture reading I want to read just to touch on this a little bit is two of them. 1 Peter 1.14 and Romans 12.2. The word of God. 1 Peter 1.14 says, Do not conform to the evil desires you had when you lived in ignorance. Romans 12.2 says, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Notice what this scripture is referring to here. Our Father tells us, do not conform to this world. But unlike part one I just talked about, our Father wants us to. But what is his specifications? He wants us to be more like him. He hopes that we be more like him. But you know what? The difference is with Jesus is he realizes that we can never conform. We are a broken people and we all fall short. And that's why the gospel message is so beautiful. And that's why Jesus died for you so that you don't have to conform. The only requirement that you have is to accept him, love him, and accept the sacrifice that he died for your sins. So just to circle all this back around. If we're convicted in this life, what typically happens is that we're sentenced, we're imprisoned, or we're condemned. If the Holy Spirit convicts us in order to save us, he loves us. He wants us to be with him. If we confess in this life, we are normally judged or ridiculed or shamed. But if we confess our sin to God, he just wants to show us his grace and his mercy, and he continues to work in our lives. If we're converted in this life, we're typically changed by the perception of others. We start to stir away from things we weren't intended to be. We start to follow the perception of, of others. But our conversion in Christ is that we draw closer to his holiness and his righteousness. And lastly, Jesus, Jesus doesn't want 100% conformity. He wants you to accept him and love him because he first loved you. Amen. In closing, I'm going to turn it over to Keith for singing him. As we close our worship for this day, it's important for us to remember the things Eric talked about in in um, conviction and confession and conversion and compliance and do all of that within the bounds of the Holy Spirit's leadership in our lives. As we close our worship, our hymn is 128, He Leadeth Me, O Blessed Thought.
church family. Uh, just so glad that you could join us. Um, I just want to say a word of blessing uh, from here as we go out in the benediction. Dear Gracious Heavenly Loving Father, uh, just bestow upon your grace and mercy upon our lives out there. Uh, may this word uh, pierce us, Lord, our hearts, our minds, our spirits, Lord, so that we draw closer to you. I be with each and every Please be with each and every one of them out there, Lord. Keep them safe, protect them out of harm's way, uh, and prepare us and anoint us for the next meeting uh, that you have set for us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.